vote. Across urban and rural communities, Black, Brown, and Native people have been denied the adequate health care and treatment that every human deserves. They are more likely to be laid off or confined to more dangerous jobs that cannot be done from home, denied proper protective equipment, and faced with barriers to even getting the vaccine. And of course, many of us know they are also straight up dying at higher rates, much higher than white Americans. Meanwhile, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the many Black people before them at the hands of the police, along with the rapid increase in anti-Asian hate crimes, are crystallizing for more white Americans than ever before. But the legacy of racism against people of color still permeates the way we treat each other on a personal and societal level. Of course, I don't need to say this to so many of you. You've been living this every day for the past year watching loved ones become sick, worried if they'll make it, working 60 hour weeks while juggling childcare and school and watching as so much of what some of us took for granted about this country turned out to be, well, frankly, a bit of smoke and mirrors. I'm very excited about the three folks we have uh, joining us today to talk about um, this very broad and big issue. Um, I'm going to start uh, off by uh, introducing them uh, and ask them to turn on their camera. Um, first, we have uh, Commissioner Carmen Rubio, who will who will turn on her camera in just a bit. Um, and we also have oh, looks like uh, she's uh, she's trying to join. Um, she's working on that um, and and. There we go. Um, and then we also have uh, two other great folks, uh, Mohammed and Eva. Now they, they all, all three of them have very fancy titles. I will let them share those with you. Um, but first I'm gonna kick it off uh, with my first question to Carmen. And uh, excuse me, Commissioner Rubio. Um, I, uh, Commissioner, I, I wanna start off by grounding um, the, the room in some, in some common definitions. I think one of the things that I've noticed um, happens in this country is that very often times when we think about racism, it gets couched as really interpersonal, right? Uh, it is a, a thing that, we, that one person does to another person. But over this past year, we've seen more and more conversation about other kinds of racism. Uh, internalized racism, um, institutional racism, and structural racism. And um, that's not my real question for you, but I know that it, we could all benefit from a little bit of grounding in those topics. I'm wondering if you have uh, any sort of uh, quick ways for people to understand those four uh, kinds of racism. Uh, wow. So uh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, so my name is Carmen Drubio. I'm Portland City Commissioner. Uh, very excited to be here today. And uh, prior to, to uh, taking this role, um, I led a culturally specific uh, Latinx founded and led organization, Latino Network for 11 years. And um, I'm three months into my new role. So just wanted to, to, to update folks and get that out of the way. Uh, that is a big question. So uh, the, the four terms were uh, interpersonal, structural, institutional and, and internalized how do you think about those four terms or, or really how do you how do you differentiate the difference between interpersonal racism and some of the much bigger uh, mm -hmm. kinds of racism that I think we're going to get into today right I think that um, what when a lot of people think about racism they tend to have uh, an idea of racism in the the interpersonal context which means um, I, I am not racist because, you know, I, I don't call people, uh, you know, debasing names or, or terrible names, or I don't act in a manner that I treat people different. Um, a common thing that I've heard are, are folks saying, oh, well, um, I, I don't see color. I don't see color. Therefore, I'm not racist. And in fact, um, interpersonal racism is is not the same as institutional or structural racism, where it may not be you personally, but it's the environment or it's the policy or it's the institution that was created at, at a time that was not designed 
uh, for BIPOC people. It was in, in fact designed in an environment where of white supremacy. It was designed for, for, for white people um, to get the outcomes for that community. It was not designed to get outcomes that were positive for our community. So we do not benefit from structures and institutions uh, that create these disparities in our communities. And that's what structural racism. And just apply that across the line to policies, um, to, to economics, uh, health, et cetera. Um, internalized racism is, um, and I'm sorry, these are not perfect, um, you know, explanations, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, you know, it's a byproduct of, ex of interpersonal racism and structural and institutional racism. It is the way that our communities have, um, over time, um, out of survival, um, out of, you know, um, disparate treatment, uh, sometimes have internalized the messages, the negative messages about our own communities or the, the negative messages that prevent us sometimes out of fear for one's life um, to not um, stand out or stand up uh, and advocate more. And that that creates its, its own set of disparities within our community. So I don't know if that's helpful, but. I, I think it's very helpful. I think one of the things we, we take for granted is that we think people might know all of these these different ways of thinking about it. Okay. Um, and what we see is that for, uh, for the vast majority of Americans, they actually don't know these other bigger right. structural things because we right. haven't really been taught to, to think about and examine that way. So I appreciate that answer. And now I wanna actually go to uh, uh, Dr. Galvez. If, uh, if we could uh, start with your introductory question. Um, I know that, so we heard from uh, the commissioner, you know, talking about big, giant things. And you're also, and I know you're involved in all kinds of advocacy, and I want to get to that later, but you're also in a, in a clinical setting on a daily basis, like uh, seeing patients. Um, and so I'm wondering from your perspective, like what, what are you seeing in patients every day that's really crystallized for you how inequities are showing up in this pandemic? Thank you so much, Jesse. Great questions. And I want to just really take a moment to um, thank the foundation for putting this great conversation together. And many of my colleagues who are out there today on the front lines, just want to thank you for the work that you've done this year to lift our community during this crisis. And it's been really an honor to be a part of this effort with Virginia Garcia. So just a shout out to all the Virginia Garcia staff. Um, thank you so much for your work. Um, I think this is a really great question because I have to admit that when I um, went into medical school, I think that I was a little bit naive. And I really believe that being a Latina with deep ties to the Latina, Latino community and with a deep understanding of the barriers and the culture and the language, that this would be enough just to, to bring health to the lives of the individuals in my community. And what I began to see as I began to practice medicine and what I began to understand was that many of the health conditions that I was taking care of were really being shaped by all these conditions that were outside of my control. So people's working conditions and people's working and living conditions. And I was really just starting to really reckon with this, with this and then COVID hit. And then I have to admit that COVID was really the moment in my life when I was able to really solidify that deep, deep connection between health and systemic inequities, particularly racism. And the way I think about it in my patients is that I wanna give you an example of farm workers. We see farm workers at Virginia Garcia Clinic. And think about the disparities that we've seen in our community with COVID in terms of illness and death. And think about farm workers. Farm workers have been excluded for years from many, many worker protections. This puts them at high risk when they're at work to get sick. And if they do get sick, they don't have health care. Now, why do we exclude farm workers who are essential from these basic benefits like health care and worker protections and sick leave? And furthermore, why do we continue to have these really low wages in these people that are working essential jobs? And what happens when people have low wages and they're exempt from benefits like retirement or overtime pay, which is what we see in the patients that I take care of? 
what happens is you have a community that continues to live in poverty. And when you have a pandemic or a crisis like COVID-19 and suddenly you have people who lose their job or are sick and they can't work, they have no cushion. And suddenly it means financial uh, distress for families and it leads to a, a cascade of problems. So when I think about systemic racism, I think about the way it impacts my patient's health. And there's no question that, that systemic racism leads to these discriminatory practices, which then impacts health. And that's how I think about systemic racism. Thank you. Ahmed, I want to bring you in now. Um, and I know um, you are also uh, involved at a clinical level, but you, you also are involved at a, at a higher, more administrative level um, in thinking through uh, a, across other, across multiple clinics. I'm wondering if you could chat about um, what kinds of decisions are you seeing be, being made at that level, good or bad, that are either fixing or perpetuating unju unjust and disparate ways of addressing the healthcare needs uh, during this pandemic? Thank you so much, Jesse, for the question. And thank you, everyone, uh, for being this panel, inviting us to this panel. And I want to thank Gail and Serena and the foundation for having me. I've been a huge fan of Virginia Garcia and the symposium for many years. So it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, yeah, I, th I think as I'd like to echo what Dr. Galvez said is in primary care, we've been able to observe firsthand. Um, obviously, my professional day to day is in Washington County, and we were able to see firsthand. I mean, we often celebrate the that Washington County is the most diverse county in Oregon. But unfortunately, our black indigenous and people of color were devastated by COVID over the past year. I think uh, we have, I mean, uh, four or five months into the pandemic, we were noticing that 50% of the cases um, were from the Latin, Latinx community, even though they only represent like 10 to 12% of the community. And so we were seeing that early on in our clinics, as far as who's showing up with symptoms, who's not showing up with symptoms. And me being part of an amazing, incredible health team of professionals across OHSU primary care, we were able to be nimble enough to react to the ever-changing guidelines from the state, from the federal government around how to address the different um, things we were learning about COVID. And we quickly acted as one team across all primary care, actually across uh, an OHSU. And we have some incredible leadership that mobilized everyone. And we were able to create, you know, we stood up respiratory clinics, for example, to help address those mo most in need. Uh, we were able to have the different clinics that are in different communities be ready for uh, um, taking on these patients and our, and our community members. We were able to partner with organizations like Virginia Garcia, like other community-based organizations. And I think it's a testament to how flexible some of these um, efforts were and how uh, we recognize that our communities are being hit at a different rate than the dominant culture communities. Uh, you know, across, we don't have obviously a, a big enough black community population here, but we did notice across the state and across the country that, you know, black uh, members of our community were dying twice as high rates as the regular community, other communities. So we weren't seeing that at clinics, but we were ready to mobilize and act in a way that we were um, as helpful as we can be. And I know that you've all mentioned the systematic racism approach to that, but I know at the in clinic level, we can't really address the systematic level of racism, but we were able to escalate to our leadership when we notice inequities and who is showing up and who is getting access. And even now with the vaccine efforts, we are seeing the numbers on a day to day and we can see clearly who is being represented in these data sets. And definitely our communities aren't being represented at a rate that we were comfortable with. And so our leadership has mobilized according to our escalation of these concerns to the state, to the other leaders in the community to help address some, some of the inequities. So I hope that answered um, the question. But... It did, thank you, Mohammed. So uh, Commissioner, I'm gonna ask my real question for you now, because you talked about, um, you know, you, you started this pandemic uh, running a community-based organization um, that, that was seeing on the ground stuff and you're ending this uh, this pandemic, like as an elected official overseeing public policy and the public response to it. I'm wondering, um, what do you think, uh, what do you think the public sector can learn from the CBO's vantage point? And conversely, what potentially uh, do CBO's uh, community-based organizations need to understand or, or see from uh, a public policy vantage point? Thank you. That's a really good question. So when, um, yeah, I was still at the CBO when this crisis uh, began, 
And what we quickly realized um, when we realized the disproportionality in our community was that there was no uh, Latinx plan. There was no uh, BIPOC plan um, to, to reach deeper into community, to do education, to, um, to uh, prioritize our vulnerable communities for testing. I think there were very good um, efforts. I think that the, at, at the government level um, to do that, um, but they just, the partnership that the groundwork wasn't laid out prior to that time. So we learned a few things about getting our communities ready. Um, we learned a few things about not to, um, uh, really that we have to be vigilant um, all the time so that when these things happen, we do have a plan in place. We do have strong lines of communication. There is a recognition by government that our uh, community-based organizations are essential um, to co-creating plans that work on the ground. Uh, we, I think we lost a lot of time up front uh, making the case for it and then actually setting it up and then getting it going. So while we have some good lines of communication and things are, are happening now, um, I feel like in those critical first days, there was a lot of opportunity, you know, windows of opportunity that were missed. Um, being on the other side of that equation now um, and understanding and seeing how, um, you know, federal relief comes in and how we're talking about community and um, realizing from, from this end, you know, it takes internal uh, folks that have um, an analysis that understands the, the, the community impacts and how it actually you know, how these resources move, move through government and actually touch the ground. Do they touch the ground? Are they really in, being implemented in, in the way that they need to be? Are they community informed strategies so that we're actually getting uh, the reach uh, that we actually intend them to do? So it, it needs to be like internal champions that have enough knowledge and awareness and relationship externally to communities on the ground. And then the other way too, communities knowing that they have the capacity and the ability and they need to push immediately to make sure that their needs are met. Uh, that, that sort of, that leads me to sort of what everyone's focused on right now, which is vaccines, right? Um, getting va vaccines to the, to the folks that need it. And Mohammed, you touched on this, the staggering disparity between uh, the, the Latinx uh, uh, vaccine uh, rates and, and, um, and other folks. I, I'm wondering if you can, if, if or if any folks um, have sort of uh, some insights into uh, what's being done. What one, why are we seeing such a huge disparity? Two, what's being done? And as you're doing that, wh what kind of roadblocks are you, are you finding or what kind of surprises are you finding as you try to address that disparity? Who wants to take it first? I can start. I think, uh, again, being part of the incredible effort by the state to collaborate with the vaccination clinics led by OHSU and Legacy Health. Um, we were noticing early on the disparities that you mentioned, Jesse, as far as who's actually getting the vaccines. And although the reasons aren't 100% clear, but the data is indicating that it is mainly our uh, individuals from our brown and black communities who aren't showing up. And, and, and in my opinion, I think it's access and a lot of barriers versus just the misconception that it's about, um, you know, the hesitancy is there obviously, but it's for many reasons, including the access. I mean, having the mass fact sites in the airport or the convention center hasn't been helpful to our communities. They are working, you know, eight to five jobs and having to go all the way to the airport. And also the access to the appointment uh, online has been a challenge. So what we've been doing is trying to expand those sites to locally, the communities, to the different clinics, to the different organizations that are helping to partner with us on getting those um, sites set up. And the other thing is also representation. We, you know, we've heard stories of, um, uh, our members of our Black, Indigenous, and people of color going into the convention center and not recognizing anybody that looks like them, for example. So the greeters, the injectors, the you know the, the professionals who are there don't look like them. So there's some kind of hesitancy around distrust from historical distrust of the healthcare system to begin with, but also over this effort because the information wasn't really deployed in a way that was inform informing the communities about what this was. Uh, you know, we didn't realize utilize professionals from within those communities to help educate our community on the importance of the vaccine, the efficacy, and the, um, the risk of not taking the vaccine versus the risk of getting COVID. So there's a lot of factors, but I think the community as a whole has collectively come together and uh, addressing these. You know, Virginia Garcia has done a great job of getting the clinics set early on before most of other organizations to get our Latinx community vaccinated. And so other communities are, are stepping up as well. 
Eva, do you have any? Yeah, I completely agree with what Muhammad has said. I think that uh, I agree that the hesitancy was a little bit overplayed and that really it's more about access. I think I completely echo what, what uh, access is often what has been a deterrent for our patients. And the other thing that I think is really is who is the messenger? I think that when you have a trusted messenger providing information about the vaccine and why it's important to get vaccinated, I think that that really kind of takes away the hesitancy. And we have been able to show that with clinics like Regina Garcia, when you have people out there um, that are giving the message in a language and in a manner that they understand, people really usually want the vaccine. And so this is something that we need to really continue to work on is making sure that we break down the barriers, make sure that our community has access and that we have a trusted messenger providing information and that is giving the vaccine. And I think Regina Garcia is an ex excellent example of this. People in our community want to be vaccinated. Nine times out of 10, they are saying yes, and they're excited and they're enthusiastic and then they're, and they're grateful. But I think we need to remember that Regina Garcia and some of the communities in Oregon are really well organized and they're doing this work, but it's not happening in other parts of the country. And so we need to continue to have this conversation. There's parts, there are places in the country where many of our community members are not being vaccinated. They're being asked for IDs. They're being asked for insurance. We know that those are the things that deter our patients. And so we need to make sure that we continue to push uh, the message from trusted messengers and that we improve access. Thank you for that. I, and, you know, I, as an aside, I've also heard stories that when, um, you know, we're, people are doing outreach to uh, many of the employers of, of Latinx communities who are working in, in uh, to help deliver us food and all of those things. And they're saying, you know, please get this to your workers that actually what they're seeing is the owners, the farmers, the, the, the office people of the canneries, like they're signing up um, first, like they're getting the thing. And, and it's, it perpetuates the idea, these ideas that, um, you know, people with agency and who feel like they have power, even if it's not meant for them, think that it is for them uh, or are, un, are unabashed about uh, uh, taking, taking that spot. And I, I think it goes down to, in some ways, uh, uh, Commissioner, was your example of sort of these, these institutional practices and, and these, um, the, the cultural um, racism around uh, who, is, who is owed what. Um, I kind of want to talk a, a little bit about, because some of this, we've seen that public policy is what helped uh, determine vaccine rollout, right? And, and who was going first and, and what was the availability of that. Um, Commissioner, both you and Mohammed are, are elected officials. And, and I'm wondering from a policy perspective, like as you start to think about um, rebuilding uh, fr from what we've been under these these past uh, many months. How do you think from a public policy perspective, we need to be thinking about this? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think that there are some lessons definitely to learn here about public policy and why, why um, in times like these, it's evident that we need folks who um, have lived experiences uh, in positions of power and authority or policy making or have the relationships with communities if you don't have that lived experience um, so that you are actually developing policy that has the intended impact that you want. Um, what we saw, you know, and what we're seeing to play out are our policies, for example, um, not prioritizing the most vulnerable communities that needed to be prioritized. Dr. Galvez talked about the farm workers that had to, to wait so long down the line before even, you know, uh, having the uh, access to eligibility um, or, um, you know, BIPOC communities having, you know, having to navigate that without structurally, without having uh, messages um, or trusted messengers or trusted CBOs who are on the front line all the time as co-creators of the message so that when they get messages, they're knowing exactly how, how to proceed or where to go. So I think that there are the lessons about we, we cannot do policy in a vacuum. Our community is much too diverse and um, so multifaceted 
And that's the, the um, incredible thing about this interesting time that we're in, where, there, where there's a convergence of so many things, you know, our, our um, you know, racial justice reckoning that's happening right now around the world, really, um, and, and along with this pandemic, but then you're seeing records of numbers of um, uh, people of color running for office and winning, or, um, you know, penetrating different sectors and this all factors when things like this happen when a pandemic happens so um structurally and you know we need to do better and uh we can't afford for this to happen again quite quite frankly mohammed you were the first muslim elected muslim in the state in the state is that right well i i, I guess I, I was told that when i first ran for office that the first Muslim immigrant to run for any public office in Oregon. So yeah, it's uh, we have a few more of us now. So um, our county and our city, so I'm proud of that, of that being among those those amazing individuals. But I think, I mean, I'd, I'd love what Commissioner Rubio said. And the only thing I would add to that from the higher ed um, lens that I'm part of the, the Portland Community College Board of Trustees and that a lot of hard lessons were learned. There's a lot of structural and gaps in our infrastructure to prepare for a pandemic or for anything to be to be honest you know we have to look at what was missing from the educational system the teachers support for teachers for resources for our students you know the air ventilation systems weren't ready the uh, the infrastructure for a virtual environment wasn't even a, a place where we can be um, nimble enough to switch to that i think you know for pcc for example we in community colleges across the country we have students who are have a lot of um, you know food insecurity or live as houseless students and so when you cook, when you immediately switch to a virtual environment for schooling, what are those individuals supposed to do? You know, when they're living out of their car or at someone's house. So I think we have learned a lot of lessons and we need to be nimble enough to work with our legislators and our policymakers to create intentional funding for pandemics and for disasters in general, but also to address some of these gaps that already existed, but haven't been addressed because we weren't in a pandemic, as you mentioned, Commissioner Rubio. And uh, there's a list of lessons that I'm sure I don't have to repeat any of them that we're all now reading about, you know, essential workers, for example, uh, you know, we've been calling them essential workers, but what have we done to value them as essential workers? Um, and I think the higher ed community is learning a lot from this experience and we're hoping to have improvements in the coming days, so. Great. And just to clarify, Mohammed, you're uh, the Port Portland Community College trustee, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. So someone had a question in the, uh, in the comment box. Dr. Galvez, you've been involved in, in advocacy as well. Um, and so I'm wondering from public policy standpoint, wh what's your viewpoint on uh, where where we go to build well, back better? That's a really great question because as, as you all know, I spend my day uh, taking care of patients and I've, I've, I've really, I have to admit that the way I see my connection, so I think policy is absolutely important. I think through policy, first of all, is the way that we can really begin to um, rectify the, the, the systemic barriers that are impacting, that are producing these health disparities that we're talking about, whether it's COVID or diabetes or hypertension, right? Because really, the, even though we're talking about COVID right now, and we're talking about um, these systemic inequities, they really impact mental health, chronic health, you know, you name it. So for me as a physician, it's really important that we do begin to create policies that rectify these inequities because if it's not COVID, you know, in five or 10 years down the road, it's going to be something else, right? And and I know that I'm going off a little bit off here, but I just wanted to say that we do need to be prepared because we can't forget that we also had wildfires this year and we also had a severe snowstorm. And when every time you have any kind of a health crisis or a natural disaster, it usually hurts the people that have less the most. And so we, we need to begin to, to, to make, to build a community that's more resilient so that we can be ready for these disasters. But as far as, as far as policy, I think it's really important. The way I see my role as a physician is a little bit different because I don't have that expertise, you know, but I am an expert of my patients and I know how these systemic inequities um, uh, create poor health. And so I see myself more as an ambassador um, and through um, the stories that I get from my patients, I see myself as a person that can carry their voice to those people who are making those important decisions like Commissioner Rubio and all of our other politicians. And so I would like to work with them 
in, in helping shape what their legislative agendas are. So, but, but I think that that's really important as a healthcare provider um, that I have a moral responsibility to really talk about how these inequities impact my patients. And so that's how I see my role. Thank you. I, thanks for bringing it back to the patients. It, it actually reminds me of a couple of things that, that I think are relevant or germane to this conversation. You know, I, I was struck by um, a study that was done not only even like four years ago that sound, found something like 40% of med students believed that the, this, that Black people had thicker skin, had fewer neurological uh, pathways, so basically had a greater tolerance for pain. Um, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, um, we almost lost Serena Williams in the hospital when she was giving birth um, because the doctors did not believe her. We have seen um, doctors of color get COVID and be in the hospital and receive very different kinds of treatment, right? So I'm wondering, if, like, as an actual practitioner, like, what do you think that we need to do to get at? Because that very daily practice of seeing patients is part of is part of the problem with the inequities, let alone access, let alone coverage, right? But so, what do you think our state needs to be doing to sort of tackle that issue? Well, I think it's important to understand that there is implicit bias in in medicine, right? And that physicians and um, healthcare providers are, are human, and and we've come in with our own biases. And I think that in order to um, begin to reduce um, health disparities and to improve health equity, we do need to look inward at our healthcare systems and we need to acknowledge that there is bias within the healthcare system, within healthcare providers. And I think that really what we need to do is we need to have kind of an inward evaluation of ourselves and realize that we all come into medicine with, with certain attitudes about health. We need to, even though we're talking about health and you know, our audience understands the social conditions and how they impact health, but you know, you go to the grocery store and you pick up a magazine and we're talking about health and we're talking about diet and medication. And so a lot of people still don't really understand how um, social conditions and health are connected. And so we we kind of walk around sometimes. Um, still with this, 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 we, we blame the communities and people sometimes when they're not healthy or where they're not making healthy choices, right? And even I think as providers, we might do that. And people who are able to um, get their diabetes under control because they're exercising and they're dieting, we, we, we praise them and that's important, but we also have to take a step back and realize that not it's not that easy for everybody because there's all of these social conditions that, that are getting in, in, into the way. So my answer for that is it's important for us to realize in the healthcare community that there is implicit, implicit bias, that we do have our own preconceived notions about health. And we need to begin to change our attitudes about health and think about it. Is it really just about an individual and a healthcare team or is it about the community? Thank you. Any other panelists have thoughts on that? I, I can add a couple of things from our perspective. And um, you know, part of being part of an academic institution, we are always striving to recruit. Um, uh, candidates for residency and there's doctors and, and staff in general that represent our community. And I think that to your point, Dr. Galvez, we have to have folks who understand our community and able to, to be able to address the conditions of our community members, you know, teaching residents that, for example, the black community deals with a lot more adverse impact of health to their lives because of historical racism. And, you know, there's a, a phenomenon of weathering where cumulative stress adds to the physical um, elements of the community and people don't realize that, you know, we have a whole year of a pandemic plus uh, social injustice plus anti-racism uh, movements to help to that have escalated these tensions. And so how do you educate the incoming cohort of residents and, and practitioners to know that these are things that are inherent in the community, not just the day-to-day -day implicit biases that they face and the unconscious bias that they go through. So I think it's education and also representation and, and recruiting uh, professionals that reflect the makeup of our communities that would help with um, with extending that knowledge. So, Thank you, Mohammed. So I, I recognize that those are big uh, and some longer term efforts. Right now, we are facing you know Congress just passed 1.9 billion American Rescue Plan. 
bunch of resources flowing uh, to the state in all kinds of buckets, including to support uh, community health. Uh, I'm wondering what you all are, are thinking about as those resources come in, in, in trying to uh, ensure that they don't perpetuate inequities. What are the kinds of things that um, people um, listening need to start asking of health systems uh, as they start to implement these things? I know, Commissioner, the, the City of Portland is one of those recipients of those large resources. Um, can we maybe start with you as sort of, can you talk about the nature of the conversations that you all are having about those? Sure, we're, we're definitely uh, focused on partnering regionally, of course, with Multnomah County and other local municipalities um, to focus on um, definitely emergent needs, um, also basic needs, um, housing uh, chiefly among them, um, as well as economic relief. Um, and then of course, a, a, big, uh, a big percentage of that is, is, is health in our partnership with the county. Um, but what I would say that we also need to, to uh, really focus on is how do we um, expand our capacity to quickly vaccinate uh, our communities across the board. And chief among them should be a strategy to partner with community-based organizations and to do more stand-up BIPOC clinics. Uh, we're, as uh, Mohammed mentioned earlier, um, the convention center is one strategy that has great outcomes for one population. But if we really want to penetrate our communities and really see, you know, move the dial on those percentages and really get the vaccine exactly where it needs to go, we, we need to do more of that partnership and have them in trusted locations around the state, not just in the urban areas, but really around the state. So I would say that that's something I know I'm gonna advocate for, for um, within my capacity, um, but also um, to do those basic needs for communities so that while they're, um, they're struggling to also manage and navigate these systems, we're also making sure people stay housed, people have food, people have transportation, and how other basic needs met. Thank you. What are Mohammed? What are you, what are you thinking about with this? I, I would agree with that, and I uh, would only add that we need to improve access to health services. I think in addressing the social determinants of health, a lot of times these system, systemic things exist already on top of the lack of access. So food insecurity, uh, you know, complementing some of the state efforts for expanding Medicaid would be amazing to have more people. Uh, be able to access the healthcare system in general, uh, and then creating some of these community-based um, settings. Like I know the uh, the mobile van, for example, is a great uh, project to have for the migrant farm workers. But having more of these um, points of access to help our community members access healthcare with the appropriate linguistically appropriate professionals and um, educational material to go to go along with that. So also behavioral health and mental health. We can't say enough about adding more resources to that area. We are struggling with that on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, you can't uh, ex ex exclude that effort as well. Thanks for raising that. I think that um, there was a great question about uh, that in the, in the chat. Like, what are we thinking about doing when it comes to the, the mental health impacts? One, we, were, we had a shortage of, of uh, of BIPOC folks able to provide that service. It was understaffed before the pandemic. And now we've all uh, gone through a year that has been, uh, I think, broadly traumatic um, and certainly fallen harder on, on certain populations, children as well. Um, so thank you for raising that uh, need to be able to, uh, to do that. We are um, uh, heading into our, our last few minutes together. Um, so I will have a last and final question, but I do want to, all of you have touched on the social determinants of health, the underlying big issues that are, are make uh, health possible um, for folks outside of just healthcare access. I'm wondering what you see um, uh, coming out of this pandemic as, as opportunities in particular, when we think about the farm worker um, community who, uh, as you've all pointed out, have been denied so many basic protections um, that workers in this country have, have been denied um, regular access to, to healthcare. Um, do you see open uh, opportunities to move on some of those um, big issues um, at, the, at either the state or the federal level? And maybe we could start with you, um, Dr. Calvez. Absolutely. Well, I think one of the lessons that we've learned is that the Latin 
communities of color are very strong. And at a time when um, I think that our leadership at our state and uh, federal um, level was, was slow to really bring services to the community, we stepped up. Um, we partnered with each other, we collaborated, and it wasn't just in Washington County. I have friends all over the state and in different parts of the country. And this was a really grassroots uh, movement um, where we came together and said, our community needs these services so that we can mitigate the impact of this awful illness. And what are we gonna do? Let's work together. And so just to see that come out of the community, our strength, our resilience. You know, this really speaks to communities of color and how we take care of each other. And I think that it's a great lesson for our leaders to learn is how, how, how we collaborated, right? And going back to, I think that communities of color are really about community and um, less about the individual. And so I think that's a great lesson. I think as we look to move on from the pandemic, um, we need to lean on the leaders that we have really identified in this pandemic. Go to them. They know, especially people, we have lots of leaders in our community that understand the community and we need to give them a voice and we need to put them, not only give them a voice, but let's give them representation. Let's give them some power so they can be at a spot where, where decisions are being made. Um, so that's really where I, I see things going. Um, yeah. Well, that's a great kickoff to my uh, final question um, before we wrap up this panel. Um, so what, I'm wondering if each of you can re reply to this, but what possible and hopeful long-term solutions do you see coming out of this pandemic? Um, we know that uh, we, we've talked a lot about what this pandemic has revealed in terms of the structural problems um, in our country, democracy, economy, health systems. But, but what's given you hope um, about what's possible um, uh, in the future? And who wants to start with that? With that? I'll, I'll, oh, Dr. Galvez, go ahead. I, I was going to take the floor just because I thought I would step, step in, but I can, what, what I, I guess I just wanted to kind of connect with what I was saying is that I do have some hope. I think there's still a lot of people in our, in our communities of color that are hurting and it's like a hurricane just passed and now we're going back to pick out, pick up the pieces and we need to make sure we don't forget them as we begin to recover. But I do think that I am seeing um, a lot of action, you know, especially when I look at Oregon's legislative agenda for, you know, this this spring where we see uh, groups who are trying to pass healthcare for all, including the undocumented and other organizations that are trying to get overtime pay for our farm workers. So I am really hopeful. And I really do think that we need to become more involved in our political process, and especially people from the community who really understand the issues. Um, I, want, I want to echo the same uh, hope that uh, that Dr. Galvez just spoke about. Um, I'm very hopeful because the positive thing that has come up out of this terrible time is that we have laid the groundwork for long-term relationships, um, long-term collaborations that will never let us get back to, to what it was like before the pandemic. And what I mean is, um, you know, as we talked about all these, um, you know, missed opportunities or, um, slow, you know, uh, ways that we were slow to act on in different fronts um, have, have revealed opportunity for us to do better and up, an opportunity for us to come together and plan better. Um, I think we're gonna start seeing more intentional proactive legislation or policies that actually plan for folks that are ineligible for, for uh, federal funds or state funds. We're gonna see more policies and proactive actions uh, around how we push our governments and our systems to anticipate communication needs um, and have, have messages co-developed and created um, for immediate release to the communities and not have translated or interpreted versions three or four days later or a week later than English, you know, for critical messages. So I feel like um, 
there's no going back on those things now. And our communities have had to push quite literally um, on behalf of, of each other for life and death reasons. So having, having that under our belt together, um, I think there's a recognition of our power, you know, and I think that is, that's gonna result in a lot of changes that we see in the next several, several years. Mohammed, what's giving you? No, I, I echo what Commissioner Rubio and Dr. Galvez says, and I could not send, say it better myself. So I have nothing else to add. That was wonderful. Well, I want to thank you panelists and, and I suppose I'll take moderator's prerogative and share a little bit more about what I'm hopeful for. As someone once said, it's stuck with me a lot. Hope is a discipline, right? It, it is a thing that we practice um, to always have hope. Um, you know, uh, John Powell says that belonging is the one of the most powerful things that we can give one another in a democracy. To say that you belong here, um, to say that you belong in our community, you belong um, uh, uh, in our neighborhood, you belong in this country. Um, and we do that by the way we treat each other on a daily basis. Um, and we also do that by the way our policies treat each other, um, by the way our media treats each treats each other. How we see ourselves reflected matters so much to that sense of belonging. So I want to thank you all panelists um, for contributing um, to that sense of belonging in our community, for being fierce advocates um, for, uh, for that ideal, um, and for joining me in this conversation today. Um, feel free to turn off your videos now. It is now my pleasure um, to introduce the Executive Director of uh, Virginia Garcia uh, uh, foundation, um, Serena Cruz. And just FYI, let you folks know, this has been recorded. We are recording. It will be up uh, and posted. So um, if you missed anything or you want to share with your friends, you'll be able to do that. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Serena. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I wish at this moment we were all in a huge room together so that we could appreciate the energy of that dialogue um, and the conversation that we just heard that just began to scratch the surface of the issues that we have so much more to explore. But I really want to start off with an appreciation for Jesse, our, our moderator. I am a huge fan of his intellect and wit and I uh, can't thank you enough for being our moderator for the third time for our healthcare symposium. You facilitate such a thoughtful dialogue and engaging conversation. Um, and today was no different. Today it was about structural racism and this pandemic, so thank you. I am deeply grateful to our panelists, Carmen Rubio, your perspective, Commissioner Rubio, your perspective adds so much uh, to the dialogue and to policy changes that we really need. I appreciate very much your comment and advice about partnering with CBOs before crises begin. Um, that is such a crucial piece of advice for all organizations to hear. Uh, and I really want to, Dr. Galvez to know that your advocacy for farm workers is crucial in our national dialogue and at the top of the agenda as you shared must be protections for farm workers. Mohammed, thank you for reframing the dialogue um, about vaccine disparity across racial and ethnic groups. Um, we clearly need to be focused on access as the primary reason why we are seeing such horrible uh, health disparities uh, across access uh, uh, in terms of vaccination across uh, people of color, all groups of people of color. Um, and the power of advocating for policies came through all of your comments. Um, when we, we, need to see, we need to make the change we want to see happen. So I just want to thank you all for joining us, for creating this dialogue, um, and a special thank you to our interpreters who made access to this dialogue through Passport to Languages, made it accessible in sign language and in Spanish. We appreciate your uh, efforts in making that connection to our audience. You know, this past year has stretched us beyond what we thought was possible. It helped us rise to meet the needs of a community that is experiencing the ravages of this pandemic at levels higher than any other. I am so deeply proud of my colleagues at Virginia Garcia, our commitment to our patients and our community from the care we provide to the advocacy that we elevate. It takes a community, a community of partners, community-based organizations, corporations, foundations, higher education, 
committed individuals like our board members and supporters, making it possible for us to innovate how we reach the community in a crisis like this, ensuring that everyone has the resources they need and the access that they deserve so that they can feel like they belong, just like Jesse shared. Over the coming weeks and months, our clinics will continue to rise to meet the community needs for the vaccine, offering it to those who would not otherwise have access to it. We'll take it to where they come into their clinics, to where they live and where they work. Um, while recent decisions at the state and federal level are finally moving us closer towards some equity goals, we have a long way to go as a state and as a nation. I wanna thank you all here who are in this audience. There were over 250 of you here today engaging in this dialogue. Each of us is responsible for looking for the ways that we can pursue equity personally and in our professional roles. I want to echo Gil when he said, we still have a mountain to climb, but we can only climb that mountain together, securing greater equity and justice in everything that we do. So I'm asking you to join us in this climb. We need volunteers. I believe Casey's going to put up a slide telling you how you can engage and volunteer. We need you to advocate for critical legislative changes and policy changes at the local um, and national, state and national level. And we need you to give. Um, the work that we're doing makes a difference in people's lives and provides access to care that they would otherwise not get. And so when you give, you make that care for Dr. Beth Galvez and all of the providers and staff at Virginia Garcia, you make that possible. So please, it's simple. There's a QR code right there or text 44321 um, and type in COVID truth and you'll find an easy way to give. I want to thank this final moment to appreciate all of our sponsors that made today's event possible, our annual sponsors in particular, A to Z Wineworks, Care Oregon, Kaiser Permanente, McDonald Zaring Insurance, Oregon Health Science and Uni Oregon and Health Science University, Regions Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Impact Benefits and Retirement. Thank you all, and a thank you to all of the. Uh, event sponsors who you can see listed on the screen today. Please join me in your appreciation for them. Well, that's it for today. Um, we really want to thank you for joining us for this virtual symposium. Your thoughtful questions and participation. There's so many more questions and a dialogue will we'll continue um, on Facebook uh, after, after, this, after this session. Um, please look for videos on our YouTube page. Uh, we welcome you to share it and to continue this dialogue in our community. And if you get us and if you get a survey from us, please fill it out. We want to do a better job with our uh, events like this in the future. So thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day, uh, and uh, we'll see you at our next event. Bye bye.